Man and His Free Will, Lecture 17 in our Handout Theology series. Man was free to choose, two, to eat or not to eat was the choice, three, a simple matter of taste, good taste, bad taste, Adam's choice of his free will. Four, she, Eve, knew it was folly to eat divinely forbidden fruit. It didn't take an Aristotle to figure that, and she was free to choose what she knew was right. Five, why didn't she? Search me. Six, search Adam, the old buck passer. But Eve explains. I wasn't as smart as my husband, but I knew I ought not to eat that fruit. Clever, tempting devil that he was, yet even I knew better. I let myself be deceived. 1 Timothy 2.14 I chose with my eyes more open than I'm given credit or blame for. Eight, why did I eat? Search me. I knew better. I even had better taste than I'm given credit or blame for. But I did it. I can't blame the devil. And Adam should have known better. He can't blame me. I should have done better. I could have done better. I chose to eat of my own free will. Ten. Adam, I am to blame. I can't blame it on Eve. I freely followed her when I knew that I ought not. It was a matter of my own free will. Now, when we come to this topic of free will in our discussion of man and his fall, we come to what most theologians tend to suggest or actually do assert is the explanation of the fall. We've talked about the decrees of God which determine in one way everything which is to come to pass. But the way by which sin was to come to pass in the sinner had to be, the feeling is, because he had a free will. As I say, this is an excruciating problem. And probably no one has given a generally satisfactory explanation. And it may well be. It's just as well not to try. I can't help but admire the brevity of the shorter catechism when it simply says, Adam being left to the freedom of his will, sin. That's a fact. There's no disputing it. Adam being left to the freedom of his will, sin. The catechism doesn't state a problem, doesn't wrestle with a problem, doesn't resolve a problem. It just states the datum, which is indisputably true. But those who tend to theologize and probe more deeply, because this really is a problem you cannot divest easily, tend to say the explanation must be the free will. So at this particular point, let's analyze the concept of free will a little more particularly to see what it does do for this particular problem and whether it is uh, any special solution for it. There's a great deal of confusion on what is meant by free will. Most in the Reformed tradition, such as John Calvin himself, simply castigate the notion, ridicule and reject the idea of free will, and determinists are usually thought to oppose that. But when they are opposing it, 
and condemning it, it is in the sense of what in New England came to be called the power of contrary choice. You can realize that that's what Martin Luther had in mind in his great work, The Bondage of the Will. He's not having any truck with any faculty which is supposed to be able to have a power of contrary choice when it's in bondage to evil. That's the only possibility that it's going to exploit if it is in bondage. And Luther is essentially the same as a Calvin position. Luther was a Calvinist before John Calvin was, chronologically. There's no basic difference. And Augustine would say the same thing about this notion, and so would Jonathan Edwards, and so would Charles Hodge, so would B.B. Warfield, and so would any recognized Reformed theologian such as A.H. Strong and the others. Now, there is another definition of free will it's commonly used also, which I don't think anybody really finds objectionable. But at least uh, because of the easy confusion of this view, which is utterly objectionable to the Reformed people, it is uh, lost in the shuffle, this valid use. But there, it simply means the power of choice. Man is not only a rational being who grasps an idea, but he also either inclines toward it or against it, but there is that in his nature which inclines, which prefers, which chooses, which wills. And since it's uncompelled or unforced by anything outside, it is called a free will. What is meant by this term free here is that this power of choice is free from external constraint. I give a simple little illustration of that in my predestination primer, that if someone put a pistol to my head while I was writing something and said, Gerstner, put down your pen or receive this bullet in your brain, he isn't forcing me to lay down my pen. He is simply giving me this option of either going on writing or going on living. But if I'm going to go on writing, I'm not going to go on living. And if I'm going to put, be put to death, I'm not going to continue writing. But it's my choice. You can't imagine a circumstance in which I would prefer to write rather than live and would ask for the bullet in my brain. But if for some reason or other this was a kind of trial of my Christianity and the book I had was the Bible and the faith I had was Jesus Christ and the choice was given to me to renounce the Word of God and the Son of God are be thrown to the lions. If I'm a Christian, I'm going to choose to be thrown to the lions. And I'm not going to say I was forced to do so. I chose to do so. I could have chosen to reject Jesus Christ. Or I could have chosen to save my life. But there's a real choice there, and it's my choice in all circumstances and what we're saying is there is no such thing as a forced choice. A forced choice is no choice. That's a contradiction in germ. A choice has to be of oneself and a free will in that sense of the word. Now, you see, that is really an indisputable conception. Every one of you who are listening to these tapes and everybody in the wide, wide world is aware of the fact that he makes choices by the dozens every day, and they're his choices. He may live to regret them or be pleased with them, but not to deny that he made those choices, whether under duress 
or under calm circumstances in his living room in the rocking chair, he made these choices of himself. Now that, if you mean by free will that, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you. And you'd wonder why Calvin and others would get such a head of steam against free will. Now, it's not in that sense of the word. It's in this sense of the word. And this sense of the word, I think, is nonsense. And so did Calvin, but it's people like Augustine and Edwards who showed this. Edwards showed it in his great book on an inquiry concerned freedom of the will more thoroughly than anybody who has ever written on the subject in the history of its debate. And so on. Now let me show you for a moment why this concept of free will is fundamentally a meaningless proposition. What you're saying here is that I have free will to come to this lecture today or not, as the case may be. Come to lecture, not come to lecture. Now, when you're contemplating that, you think of certain arguments for it. Say it's Sunday morning. You always go to church on Sunday morning. Uh, it happens to be this particular subject in which you're interested, or your wife goes to this class and you go with it, or that uh, you have been coming, and even though you're a little tired this morning, uh, you don't like to let the leader down. There could be dozens of dozens of reasons. On the other hand, you are tired, and this does require hard thinking at certain times, and you would like to get a little more rest, and you are going to the church service afterwards anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I see you here this morning, and I know you have freely chosen to come. You weighed the evidence for coming and the evidence for not coming, and the evidence in favor outweighs this evidence, and there is no possibility at all under those circumstances of your not coming. You see what I mean? There's no power of contrary choice. You may consider or debate or reflect on contrary choices, but when the will is made, there is for you this morning no freedom not to come. You literally have to come as volitional beings because it seems good to you to come, to make the choice to come. The idea that you could not come when you are inclined to come is, of course, an absurdity. Unless somebody had lassoed you and dragged you in or something like that, then we would know your will had nothing to do with this. This was not a choice on your part. Somebody else chose to bring you here. But where you come, unconstrained by anything external, we know that that is the only option you have. Now, suppose somebody said, look, I don't like that idea, Gerstner. That really takes freedom away, in my opinion. I'm only free for this option. I'm not free for that option. I say, yes, that's true. You're only free for this, not for that, because you personally are inclined this direction. Nobody's pushing you. This is your decision, but you can't decide against what you seem to feel is good for you. What is your actual preference? Well, look, he says, suppose we do go through this kind of process you're talking about, and the evidence is, say, 10 to 1 to come rather than not come. Are you going to tell me, Mr. Gerstner, that I could not have decided to come anyway just to show that I'm able to defy the reasons in the case? I say, no, I wouldn't deny that possibility. But what would have happened in that case is that objectively considered, you had 10 rather strong reasons for coming and only one reason for not coming, and that normally overbalanced it, but all of a sudden you went into a rage about this idea, the power of contrary choice, and all of a sudden it became extremely important to you to try to show there is such a thing as power as contrary choice. And you're going to choose then against your inclination. 
But don't you see what's happened? That outweighs everything. You don't just tend to one. It isn't that. This one could be a, a more potent one than all these considerations put together. And that determination on your part to show that you can make a choice contrary to your choice is, of course, what is all important with you. And consequently, under those circumstances, you couldn't come. This would be the choice, really, just because you thought you would be displaying something by your coming when there were so many arguments against it. No, there's no such thing as a contrary choice. Your will is free, not in the sense it's free of the reasons for your choosing what you choose, but it's free from being compelled by external circumstances. You are the one who actually weighs the evidence, and when that evidence is weighed by your mind, you incline accordingly. So man was free to choose, and all we mean by that is it's a part of our nature to have not only the power of intellection or understanding, but also of the power of inclination, preference, or choice. In this particular case, the, the choice was to eat or not to eat. And you might ask the question here, because it's an intriguing matter, what was the point of God in this matter of forbidding that tree? Why did God say, you shall not eat of this particular tree? We don't know for sure. There have been all sorts of speculations. It's altogether possible that forbidding this particular tree was for no other reason. This is possible. That's all I'm saying, possible. Forbidding this tree, this particular tree, for no other reason than testing obedience. I read once of a monk in the desert who had some people who had come to him to study under him, to be his disciples, and he had a routine test for them. If he was going to admit them into his company for instruction in monasticism, he made them get a dead branch, put it in the ground, and for one year, every day, water that dead branch. Why? Just to practice obedience. Absolutely no other reason. Water doesn't do a dead branch any good, and they knew it. But for one year, they had to do that. Just, and if that's what you're an interested in, the testing of obedience, and that's what God was interested in, whether his creatures would obey their creator. Now, there may have been more to that. It may have been sex. It may have been pride. It may have been a half a dozen other things. But the main thing is that it was a testing of obedience. They were to cultivate the animals and the plants and live together in harmony. But this one thing they were not to do, whatever it meant, it certainly centrally meant a test of obedience. And it was, as I say, number three, a simple matter of taste, good taste, bad taste, Adam's choice of his free will to taste or not to taste, to eat or not to eat, very simple. No complexities or subtleties here. There it was, right in the garden. They saw it every day, and they knew every time they saw it, that was the verboten, that was forbidden, there was not to be any tasting. Every other tree you could eat, you could cultivate, you could enjoy. This tree you could look at, but nothing more. Four, she, Eve, knew it was folly to eat divinely forbidden fruit. It didn't take an Aristotle to figure that, and she was free to choose what she knew was right. Eve probably was not as smart as Adam. She certainly was not as smart as Satan. But she had God on her side. See, some people may be inclined to think that the explanation of the fall is a battle of wits. 
and that Eve was unfairly and inadequately, and so was Adam for that matter, matched with a superintelligence of Satan using actually one of the creatures of God as his vehicle of temptation. And it's an a, 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 a intellectual match between, in the first place, between Eve and Satan. Now you know, if it were a test of wits, that this couldn't possibly be a fair encounter. She was not in a league with him, and even her husband was not as well. In one sense, as far as native endowment, she didn't have anything comparable to the intelligence of this super angel. But she had the knowledge of God. And there is no comparison of the knowledge of God and Satan. So though natively, a human creature may have been inferior to the angelic creature with the knowledge of God on her side, all the balance of power went this way, not that way. Satan, clever as he is, working against God, couldn't begin to match the intelligence of Eve with the knowledge of God. So there was nothing unfair about that. It was not a case of Satan being able to deceive her because he simply had a superior intelligence. He was able to deceive her only because she didn't use the intelligence which she had from an infinitely superior source, namely God. Now, why didn't she resist this forbidden fruit? Search me, search Adam. Eve explains, I speculate this way. I wasn't as smart as my husband. The reason I say that, we know that uh, the person in the world right now who has the highest IQ is a woman, and so on. And theoretically, there's no reason in the world Eve could not have been smarter than her husband. Many wives are smarter than their husbands, and so on. The reason we speculate here is that uh, Paul says in Timothy there that Eve was deceived because she was supposed to have been in a subordinate position and exposed herself to temptation when she should not have done so, and so on. And Satan must have done that because he suspected that she was the weaker vessel here and was more easy to attempt, and partly because he had already gotten her out of her place of subordination into acting on her own independently of Adam and contrary to the commandments which Adam had been given by God. It wa I wasn't as smart as my husband, but I knew I ought not to eat that fruit. Clever, tempting devil that he was, yet even I knew better. You know, this account we have of the temptation by Satan, the Sprechen der Schlange, the speaking serpent, we don't have all the details, but it does look from what is said in the book of Genesis as if in the early days the serpents did actually weave their way among the trees and so on and were not confined to the ground, which was a later characteristic of the serpent, that they walk on the earth. And as such, they would be mingling with the human uh, creatures with whom they had a, freddy, a ready type of... Uh, of uh, communion, as we still do have with uh, some animals. And uh, it looks as if this uh, serpent, which spoke to Eve, was a particularly attractive one, almost a cuddly one, curling around her, perhaps, uh, and uh, uh, being with her. And one day, it did something which was not native to it, namely, it spoke. And that, of course, would have surprised her. She was used to enjoying weaving around, petting it and stroking it perhaps, and all of a sudden, to hear it, it didn't speak, of course, it was Satan who used the uh, uh, instrumentality, kind of ventriloquist as it were, he made it look as if the serpent speaks. The serpents even in those days didn't speak, but uh, it was made to think, and that of course would put Eve off her guard and so on, but she'd still remember. God said, don't eat of that tree, and he was the source of all being, including this cuddly snake and so on, and she knew full well she was not to do what the serpent said. So she says, I think ultimately, I let myself be deceived. 
The Word of God tells us plainly she was deceived. We know that Eve was deceived. Thus saith Scripture. I'm speculating on the fact that she recognized that she allowed herself to be deceived. Paul doesn't say she allowed herself to be deceived. She said, he simply said she was deceived. I say that because she was deceived only because she allowed herself. She didn't need to be deceived, and I'm sure the apostle would agree with that. I chose with my eyes more open than I'm given credit or blame for. <coughs> Why did I eat? Search me. I knew better. I even had better taste than I'm given blame for. But I did it. I can't blame the devil, and Adam should have known better. He can't blame me. I should have done better. I could have done better. I chose to eat of my own free will. I think this is the all-important thing, you see. The mind was first of all deceived. It ought not to have been deceived because it had a lucid commandment from the all-wise God. But once deceived, the will inclined toward the deception. It shouldn't have been deceived in the first place, and it should not have inclined toward the evil which was involved in it, but it did. Now, why it did, that, as I say, is the excruciating problem. We're only telling how it did, how it came about, and the fact that the original creatures of God in the human form were themselves guilty persons, and they can't pass the blame from husband to wife to devil. All of them were involved in the same, the devil from the very beginning of that particular temptation, but even Adam alike, because they did have a mind that could be perceived. It need not have been a will which could incline to deception, which it ought not to have been. So there's an agony actually in the very beginning being torn apart by the fact that you do something which you know is stupid in the first place and wicked in the second place, and uh, how, why you did it, you can't understand yourself, but you know full well you did it. And there's no excusing you, and when the ax falls, and when God lowers the boom, and when they're driven out of the garden, mortality strikes them, and spiritual death immediately invades them, they know it was their own fault, and nobody else. And I have Adam at the end saying, I am to blame, after all, the probation rested, as we shall see, on Adam, not on Eve. I am to blame. I can't blame it on Eve. I freely followed her when I knew I ought not to. This was the ruin of the human race, and we'll analyze it a little more fully in the next lecture.